one minute until showtime. Good evening, everyone. I hope everyone on Facebook and YouTube is able to hear me okay. For those watching, we will be starting in just um, one moment. And my special guest is on hold. So please give me a thumbs up if you can hear me okay. Awesome. Thank you much. Your show will go live in five seconds. Four, three, two, one. Good evening, everyone listening on Blog Talk Radio that goes out to multiple platforms. Those of you that are watching on Facebook Live on different platforms and on YouTube, you got Sherry Lynn here from the old Chickahominy Swamp down by the railroad track, and you just missed hearing the train go by. Casey Jones was not driving it, though, so it's gone on through. Tonight, 
I wanted to make a point to do a different kind of haunted tales from the old rocking chair. And I've got a exceptionally exciting guest for this evening. Her name is Wendy Weir. She has written, she wrote a book called In the Spirit, Conversations with the Spirit of Jerry Garcia. She is the sister of Bob Weir, guitarist from the Grateful Dead. She is, uh, I, don't really, I don't even know how to start this other than saying before I bring her out of the green room and off of hold. Um, through telepathic communication with Jerry Garcia, legendary member of the Grateful Dead, Wendy Weir, sister of dead guitarist Bob Weir, presents Jerry's deep, loving, and often humorous insights from the realm of spirit and his wishes not only for the band that has become a cultural phenomenon, but for each and every one of us. She has written a spectacular book. You, She's been so generous to come on live this evening with me and talk to you about this book. And I've got a trivia question this evening. So if you have got your thinking skull cap on um, and end up getting the right answer to the trivia question this evening. She's been generous enough to offer an autographed copy of her book. So without further ado, because I am just entirely too excited, I am bringing on the one and only Ms. Wendy Weir. How are you this evening? I'm fine, Sherry, and thank you for such a wonderful introduction. Well, I hope I did you some sort of justice because I'm just so excited about this. Your book is phenomenal and the gift that you have is phenomenal and the, the legendary Jerry Garcia that you've written about and communicate with is just phenomenal. I and so it's truly an honor to have you on this evening. Thank you. Um, I do want to mention, though, that we all have this ability. Um, I just happen to have developed it to a certain point. Um, I also, you know, I, I believe in other lifetimes. And I also believe that this is an agreement that Jerry and I had before coming down here. Uh, so, uh, and I am privileged to have been the communicator of his words. It was uh, quite an interesting journey and continues to be. He's still with us. I'm, I'm glad you said that because uh, that everyone's got these gifts. I think some people may be scared to realize that they have the gifts and then others not so much um, or are more open to it. And so I'm I'm glad that well, you you know you you mentioned that. Yeah, in all honesty, fear is really good when it comes to channeling. Um, you know, and I learned sort of the hard way, even with a, a teacher. And I um, when I was just starting out with channeling, I read this fabulous book by Samaya Roman called Opening to Channel: How to Connect with Your Guide. And I missed a part in there that said, um, you know, always have the guards, you know, guardians and protectors around you when you're opening the channel and make sure that you channel at the highest level. I missed that part. Okay. So you sort of like, you really shouldn't skip the steps like I did. Mm -hmm. And when I first started, I got into a meditation and I was, you know, connecting to my higher guides and it's sort of like um, part of the guided imagery is to walk into an elevator at ground floor and then you take it up to a higher level. Well, mine stopped at level two, the doors opened and this horde of barbarians with swords and, you know, rifles and everything 
tries to barge into the elevator and it's like, what is happening here? <laughs> Where did you guys come from? Get out of here. You know, and I quickly closed the door. And it's like, what did I miss in this? So I went back to the book and there it was saying, you know, always make sure that you're protected by your guides before doing any of this work. So fear is a really good component in channeling, um, uh, but it's also channeling is a very natural gift that when used properly, when we're trained to use it properly, can be very, very rewarding and informative and supportive and expansive and all of these fabulous things. I just, I, I'm so, I was so enthralled and just, just taken back reading into your book and how it was you started off with dreams and you know taking on the meanings and then seeing things and uh, I mean t you want to tell everybody when you when did you actually start to notice I mean I know but um from reading some of your bio but around age 14 but did you have anything happen before age 14 that that no i was really i mean i still am normal but um you know life was really normal and mom and i we have an older brother john we grew up in a wonderful family very stable loving supportive and a great area and you know outside of san francisco and um, everything was fabulous. I sort of had the feeling that it wasn't always going to be this way. And at age 14, my mother told me that she had cancer. She had breast cancer. And so at that time, it was sort of like the death knell. This is going back into the um, late 60s. Or actually at that time, it was the yeah, mid 60s, early 60s to mid 60s. And so my whole focus, you know, was still, of course, school and getting good grades. I was always the good little one, the good girl in the family. Bob was always the rebel. <laughs> um, and He's the, he was the youngest, right? No, I'm the youngest. He's the middle. Oh, okay. So he kind of slipped and, through the cracks. So. Yeah. <laughs> Because I could not imagine losing both parents so close together like that. So my my well, heart really was, goes out to you and yeah. your brothers. I mean, because that's just that had to have been such a significant blow, and so young too, twenty one for you. I mean, that's just well. Yeah, we also you know knew this was coming too. So it wasn't like it was, a, well, with my mother, we knew it was coming with my father. Uh, we didn't have much time to be aware of that. I mean, we had maybe six months or so because he didn't tell us until towards the end that he too had cancer. Oh, wow. um, the reality was he didn't want to live without my mother. So there was no surprise in that. And we had this. Um, at my father's, my mother passed away first. My father and my father's memorial service. Bob and I, it was the most amazing, blessed experience because we had a lot of people there and this sort of area opened up around the two of us. No one was talking with us, just the two of us. And I had this incredible experience. 
experience of divine love at a level you cannot conceive of, you know, basically here on earth. It was, you know, from my mother, from my father saying, we're here with you. We're sorry we had to leave. We're together now and we're really happy and we will always be with you, you know, with this incredible love. And so I'm listening to this and I'm looking at Bob and I'm going, I wonder if he knows this is going on too. And I didn't say anything at the time. And it was probably about five or six years later, and it was a real rare occasion where once again it's just the two of us having dinner out. And I'm going, you know, Bob, did you have this experience at all at the memorial service? And he said, Yeah, I did. And it was so I mean, it was such an incredible gift our parents gave to us. So even though there was a loss in their passing, there is also this gift beyond belief of divine love, and that has stayed with me. So it's, yes, you go through the process of mourning and grieving and dealing with it, you know, over many years, but oh, yeah. the love has stayed with me, too, and oh, that's yeah. been far greater. And, you know, I think that's important, too, that it's okay to still mourn the loss of someone that you've loved because it means that they left a fingerprint on your heart, you know? That's the way I've always looked at it is as long as you speak their name or think about the fun memories and the fond memories or even some of the crazy memories, it keeps them alive here. And I feel like it keeps their spirit closer to you, you know, just knowing that they've left that fingerprint on your heart, that they they're not yeah. just, they haven't just faded away into nothing you know and so it's I think that's very precious um before we go into more I want to remind everybody if you want to call in this evening the call in number is one three two three eight seven zero three eight seven seven and you can press one to come on air to speak to Ms. Wendy Ware or myself, I don't, I cannot even begin to top what this wonderful woman, oh my gosh, what a blessing I did, I had today checking my email and checking my voicemail. You just made my, it was like being told I hit the lottery. <laughs> just, if you could have heard the squeal, which you may have from the west coast from the east coast to the west coast you may have heard the squeal because it was like no oh my gosh <laughs> but it but i mean and just talking well, to you today I, I just, I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here so thank you very much for having me so tell us how you started into moving forward into getting the messages i mean what I absolutely love, well, let me let me go back one. The dreams that you had, I thought, were pretty amazing. The dream that you had about death and that it didn't necessarily mean death. It meant the end and a new beginning, which I thought was very special and very touching. But it was also the story of Otis that also just <laughs> just tickled me to no end because I am an animal lover too. Every stray cat in the neighborhood seems to find my house. I think I grow them now. <laughs> so I mean, tell everybody how you just how you. You didn't fear this. You picked up the ball and ran with it. Well, regarding, you know, um, Otis was very special, so we'll get to Otis in a bit. But, you know, regarding running with it, I needed answers. So not only did I have this incredible experience of love with my parents after passing, mm -hmm. um, prior to that, uh, when I went to pick up my mother's possessions at the hospital after she had passed away, I saw, first of all, the lady that was at the desk, you know, turning them over to me happened to have been a friend of my mother's. It was like, okay. And then she gave me the possessions, of which one of them was my mother's wedding ring. And I see my mother's wedding finger, just a finger, mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. is incarnate, that's the finger. And she wants the ring on it. And I'm, this lady's having a wonderful conversation with her dog says all this stuff. I'm, I'm looking at her, and I'm looking at this finger floating in the air that wants this ring on it. And it's like, okay, uh, I think I need to go to the mortuary. And I'm not telling the lady this because she thinks I was totally nuts. But I said, I need to go to the mortuary and put the wedding ring in my mother's urn. She's already been cremated and, and we have the urn. And so I take everything and I take the ring and I go to the mortuary and I said, hey, uh, can you open up the urn and put the wedding ring in? And the mortician says, uh, no, I can't. And I'm going, uh, you're going to have to. And he says, but why? It's real. I'm going, my mother wants it. And he's looking at me, he said, what do you mean? So I explained the situation to him, I said, look, she's going to pester me until you do this. She really wants her wedding ring with her, you know, in with the ashes in the urn. And so he said, all right. And I gave him the ring, total faith that he would keep his word. And he took it and went in the back. And I left. And I know he kept his word because she stopped hugging me. You know, she was happy and the ring was with her. That's amazing. So with that, I'm going, I need to learn how to work with this and have, you know, in essence, more control over the vision to understand them better. And that's when I started working with a psychic in Berkeley, um, you know, and taking classes for several years and really, you know, developing my ability with professional guidance. I didn't just jump into it willy-nilly. I made sure that, you know, I had guidance on it, which was extremely valuable. So Mm -hmm. I put, and I continue to practice this, you know, every day for all of this time and making sure I have the highest vibration possible to get the clearest information. Yeah. And be safe. Yes. Yes. So, So, um, so with that, you know, another segue with, um, you know, doing, you know, talking to Bob about the spirit world and dead people and communicating after death. He's very open to all of this. And he certainly has his own experiences and his own tales to tell. But um, when someone would pass away in the band, such as Brent Midland, and yeah. later Vince Wellnick and, you know, Jerry and up, he would call me and said, hey, can you check in with them? And so I would do that, and then I'd write it up, and I'd call him back, and I said, okay, this is what I got. And so, uh, and it has, Bob continues to do this to this day. Aww. So when when Jerry passed away, I had just gotten back from New York, and Bob was on tour back there on his own with um, probably Rat Dog at the time. And he calls me and he says, have you heard yet? And I said, no, you know, I'm just sort of getting up early in the morning, my time, I was just getting up. And he said, Jerry passed away. And I'm going, oh my God. And he said, can you check in on him for me? And I said, sure. And so that was the beginning of this journey. I had no idea it was going to lead to all of this. I'm eternally grateful that it did. And it was, it's really been an amazing, you know, process and experience. I'm, I'm just so grateful for it. But um, that was the beginning, Bob asking me to check in on Jerry and everything that unfolded from there. Oh, I can tell you, as one reading your book, that anyone who reads your book is going to be eternally grateful that not only did you were you willing to take it on, but you shared your gift and, and knowledge and with everyone else because it's just so, it's so precious. It really is. I, I, I have to be honest. You say I was willing to take it on. You have no idea the conversations I had with Jay or Jerry saying, are you kidding me? Are you going to do what? Do you know how crazy people are going to think I am? I'm serious. I can imagine. I went back and forth, and he was relentless, you know, and, you know, and part of it was it needed to be done, and I realized that, and, you know, once 
he decided to stay. He was leaving. He was on his way out. He says, you know, the earth is painful. My body's painful. You know, drugs are terrible. You know, I'm out of here. Goodbye. And I'm going, wait, 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 wait. No, you aren't done yet. Once he decided to stay, he was relentless. And the poor diabetes that he had to deal with, too. I mean, he just. Uh, that That's just, yeah, that's just some of it, you know. Yeah. Jerry being Jerry, of course, did not, nothing that the doctor said to do. You know, have sugar? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Eat nutrition properly? No way. <laughs> you know, so, you know, and along with the, the drugs and the heroin and the band tried everything, there was intervention, and Bob was so proactive on everything with him. And Jerry just got to the point where he honestly didn't want to live. You know, his, his body and everything was just failing, and he felt that on one level, he could be of greater service from the other side where he was not hindered by all of this, these earthly issues. And, that's, and he's, he was totally correct. Yeah, and yeah, and I'm, I know I'm sitting here chuckling, but I can hear him I can almost hear that laughter that he had, that contagious laughter. And, but I can also just imagine the, you know, um, the, you know, I'm just not strong enough to be here, but let me get on the other side of this so I can, like, manage things because this is out of control. And I can be strong. Yeah. I can yeah. be stronger in just, spirit. You know, physically. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I, I was just going to say it wasn't just physically. Um, things were getting out of control with the deadheads too. It wasn't peace and love anymore. You know, they had riots a, a year or so before he died. Um, yeah. The the crowds were getting rougher. You know, the days when they started out with. You know, the hate Ashbury, Peace and Love, and Flower Children had shifted. And it was a new, I mean, there's still, and still continue to be, you know, I use the word old deadheads, which are the ones that hold this image of oneness, or, or this belief and feeling of oneness and love and community and family. They are totally still here. But at that time, there was this other element that came in that made their life really rough. Yeah. And it wasn't fun anymore. So I, I totally understand, you know, where he was coming from, you know, in addition, you know, or aside from his health issue. Yeah. And um, by, by him passing, he was actually freed up the other members of the band to do and be creative in their own right, which they couldn't be, you know, with the dead because the dead had kept putting them in a box and keeping them in a box. You know, and Jerry talked about it, Bob talked about it, you know, of we want you to do the same old music that we're comfortable with and we know. We don't want you to do, you know, your own blues. We don't want you to do, you know, a new country song. We don't want you to do a jazz, you know, just do what, you know, you've always been doing. And then we're happy. And you're dealing with incredibly talented artists who have so much to express musically. Mm -hmm. that they were feeling as though they were in prison. I can imagine. And so with Jerry's passing, yeah, with Jerry's passing, it actually freed them to find themselves and to express who they truly were and are. You can see their, their journey, all of them, over the years. That has been very, very fulfilling. That I, they could not have done if Jerry had lived. I've got a question for you out of Facebook. Is Jerry happy with John Mayer? <laughs> you know, that isn't um, even a question for Jerry because from where Jerry is, it's about everybody. It's about the people. It's about the fans. It's not a, about is he happy with John Mayer, you know, doing lead guitar and sort of taking his place. He doesn't, that doesn't even occur to him at the level that he is working. Okay, that that should have uh, happily answer Renee Renee's question. 
that she was asking. I also have chat open on Blog Talk for those who are listening. Again, the number is one three two three eight seven zero three eight seven seven. And press one if you want to come on the air to ask this wonderful guest this evening. So continue on, Wendy, if you don't mind, and tell me about how you could, well, go on from, Otis Otis tickled me, but I do have to share with you that the dreaming, uh, that hit home for me, too, because of my own personal experience with that. And it's almost like there are some dreams that are intended to be more like, hey, you need to get ready for this. And other dreams are um, more like visits than dreams, I guess, if that that makes sense. And um, I myself, I had dreams about my father passing for about two and a half weeks every night waking up at the same time and it was just my dad's going to pass away and it was like i told two people because i thought i'm losing my mind he's not sick i don't know what's wrong i don't see why he's passing i just know he's passing and the night that he passed i called my parents home, I dialed the number and stopped before pressing the last number and hung up and was asked, why did you hang up? And I said, because he can't come to the phone right now. And about an hour went by and the phone rang and I burst into tears and I said, that's the call. He's gone. And it was them telling me that uh, there was an issue at my parents home and my mom needed me and I asked is she okay and they said yes and I said I know he's gone I'm on my way and somehow I made a 20 minute drive in seven minutes which we still have we have no idea how that worked out but I think it was to strengthen me and you know prepare me because my mother could not handle it nor could my younger sister at the time So it was kind of like my dad's way of going, hey, you know, and a greater power saying, you need to get prepared because your dad raised you to be the strong one in the family. So get ready because it's coming. So when I read that about you with your dreaming, it was like, wow. Okay. I'm glad, not glad that you, you've also had that experience but glad to know that i'm not the only one out there that has these kind of has had those kind of dreams where they're like okay get ready (laughs) this is your you know warning you know that things are about to change so yeah and 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 for me i mean it's very rare to have uh, you know dreams like that that are that crystal clear. I'm, I'm not into dreaming. There are a lot of people that have, you know, made a wonderful art out of it. Um, I certainly have dreams and I recognize dreams and there are some though that you know are like, you don't mess with, they're the real thing. You know, they're really communicating a message. And those, you know, for me, fortunately, are, are fairly rare. So, but so when you have them, you have to pay attention to them. Yeah. Yeah. And do you journal, dream journal, or? Uh, I have, you know, um, the on and off. So I don't necessarily journal on a regular basis. I do, I have a daily meditation practice. Um, Sometimes it's a contemplation. Sometimes it's an attunement, you know, to the higher frequencies. So it varies. But I always take time every morning, you know, when it's really, really quiet to just spend time within myself and uh, get a sense of, you know, sort of what's going on. You know, I'm a Libra, as is Bob, 
him. You know, we're very much into peace and harmony and, uh, you know, all of that. So I like things to be very, you know, uh, balanced yes. in my day. And I try to get it off to a good start by balancing it in myself. And that gives me the ability to deal with everything that comes up during the day. That good grounding time and, yeah, really getting, just yeah. having that time to ease into the day, get grounded, get balanced, and just kind of focus without too many, as, as many, as few interruptions as you can possibly handle anyway, I suppose. <laughs> you know, some things come up you really can't handle yeah. or stop, but... but yeah. So you know, and the other thing that's so important is to spend time in nature. Mm-hmm. I mean, and, and even if it's just going out onto your lawn and taking off your shoes and standing barefoot on the grass, you know, connecting with the earth. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, or sitting on a rock or going on a hike. It is so critical to really get in touch with just that the beauty and the truth and the you know, the frequency, the vibration of life around you, of, you know, this natural world that we live in that is so amazing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And to just the fresh air, the out, whether it's raining or sunshine or, well, of course, if it's thunder and lightning, don't stand outside in the lightning. But, yeah, I mean, just there's days if we have a gentle rain, I'll go stand outside for just a few minutes just to feel some rain on my face. Um, I love that getting outside and, and standing there barefooted, just really digging your feet in the ground for a little bit and walking around. And of course, summertime, it's watch out for the legless uh, friends that we have sliding around here in Virginia. That like to <laughs> pop their head out, and it's like, um, okay, I uh, really don't want to run into you. So, yeah. Um, so, I just you, want to add, it's hmm? also really important to express gratitude every day. Yeah. You know, to be in a state of appreciation and to be grateful you know, for all that we have in our life. Oh, yeah. I mean, I can't tell you how how throughout each day I try to share something on social media or whatever or tell someone, you know, hey, I realize you're down, but you can actually hear me. Be grateful for your hearing. You can see me. Be grateful for your vision. You can get up and walk around. Be grateful for these things. Um, it, even if it's something that small. And of course, you know, can go on from there. You've got a roof over your head. You've got food in your belly. You've got people who care about you and love you. You know, so you can build on it. But at least start with, hey, you can hear me talking to you or you can see me talking to you or read what I'm typing to you. You're doing so much better than some other people. So, yeah, be thankful for all these small things and build on that. So many people will take for granted. Yeah, which is why. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, which is also why the name Grateful Dead is you know, so powerful. Mm -hmm. you know, it's the expression of gratitude in behind the meaning of the name. Yeah. You know, and it's, uh, being of service to others, doesn't matter if you're alive or dead. You know, you can be of service to others and help them and, and benefit them. I love how you worded that. Being of service to others. And uh, that's just, what? it's being a good human. You know? Well, or, or <laughs> you know, uh, being a good spirit. Yeah, exactly. You know, Jerry is, is Jerry's very focused. 
I mean, he's deeply, deeply, deeply committed to being there for those who call to him. And, you know, it's, you can call to him with your thoughts, you can call to him with your heart, and he will be there. And it may not be in the way that you expect, you know, it may not be a, a channeled message where he's speaking to you. Um, maybe you need help with a certain segment of your, of the song, you know, the guitar that you're playing and the riffs and everything. Um, I know many people who have felt Jerry, you know, they'll say, oh God, Jerry, can you help me with this? And they'll feel his presence or they'll feel him come into their body and sort of take over and they'll start playing in a way that totally amazes them that they have no idea they could do. And it's all over and they go, oh my God, that wasn't me. You know, are just people having stress in their life or problems and they need sort of a hug. You know, say, hey, Jer, can you give me a hug? Can you help me through this? He will be there. You know, maybe it's a song that you're familiar with that has special meaning to you that comes on. You know, maybe it's just, you know, a breeze or, uh, you know, a kiss on the cheek that you feel with no one around. Yeah. But if you call with your heart and with your thoughts, you know, and, and true sincerity, he is always there for you. Yeah, there are, I have to be honest, there are days when I'll get in a, you know, I'll, I admit, I will get on YouTube and I will fall down that rabbit hole listening to different music and things. But I will end up on something that Jerry's talking and he will laugh. And that laughter that of his will just make me grin because it's, it is so contagious. And I can hear it echo and echo and echo. And I just... I love that laughter. Always, always. He just always had such a special yeah, way, there. you know, and even going to the shows, I, as grateful as the fans were for the band, I always got the impression that they were equally grateful for the fans. And like we were talking about today, oh, okay. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, you know, as far as the band is concerned, they couldn't be there and do what they do without the fans, you know. So the, the way it works and the way the band sees it and the way energetically it, it happens is the band will, you know, be at one stage and they'll get started and they'll get started with the music. Um, you know, it, it uh, over, you know, it starts to build, you know, some shows are certainly better than other shows, but um, in general, you know, they'll get into it and it starts to build and they'll move through it. And they're very careful in the songs they choose for a set list with the goal of having it get build and accomplish an objective, which changes from show to show. Mm -hmm. And so the what the fans do as the band starts getting into it, it's sort of like, they start really tuning in and into their spirit more. So it's their social faces uh, sort of drop and they start melding together and working together as this greater entity, this oneness. And as they do that, that also encourages the fans to open up and to get into that frequency and to contribute to that. So the whole show experience is a blending. It's like a figure eight of the band playing their music, you know, at their frequency, blending with the fans playing, you know, listening to it and getting back at their frequency. And it builds into this incredible oneness that then goes up into the cosmos and the universes. I mean, it's a frequency. Oh, and, nice. you know, I'm, I'm sort of skipping ahead a little bit, but there are, there used to be, a, you know, a couple of, this is interdimensional, so, uh, you know, I, I view outside of this dimension that, you know, there'd be spaceships, you know, a couple of spaceships sort of coming in, mm -hmm. certainly, uh, you know, there's more than just, you know, earthly humans in exactly. this existence. Exactly. And um, there, so there'd be a few spaceships coming in to listen in the early days, and then there got to be more and more. And, you know, 
towards the end with the dad, there were just masses of them coming in. It's like they, you know, the word went out, hey, there's a show, you know, tune into the frequency. And they'd all come in and I'd be, you know, just going forever. There'd be spaceships. And that continues to this day, even with Dead and Company. You know, they hold this incredible vibration and integrity and music that is uh, just, you know, breathtaking. And so in, in combination with the fans, it's what goes out into the multiverse and is received by, by multiple beings and multiple worlds. Yeah. It's just amazing. Oh, it, it absolutely always was. I mean, I'm... Um thinking back to well i'm also sharing some of the pictures um from when they came to well i saw them in july of 1989 at rfk um and then in october and they came to rfk up near dc as the grateful dead um then in Hampton, Virginia, October of 1989, um, they came as the Warlocks because the Commonwealth of Virginia didn't want the Grateful Dead playing in the Commonwealth of Virginia. So we all knew if you were a deadhead that the Warlocks was their first band's name. So, and it was like, okay. And I'm looking at you know, my concert ticket stuff was eighteen fifty in nineteen eighty nine. Of course, the gas price was ninety seven cents for <laughs> low grade gas. <laughs> but it was a time of people actually socialized with each other, and you just—it was so. It was a like we talked about today like going to a fair or a festival for two to three days. You just parked your car and everybody got along. Everybody just, it was like, look out for each other. And I know it was even probably even more so even earlier on. But like he said, as time went on, and you get the commercialism in there and the control factor in there and corporate whatnot, it starts to, and then a whole different generation comes in to the picture, into the mix and everything started to change. And it was like, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know that I could picture Jerry being here right now in this in this world in this realm right now with the way things are right now if that makes any sense he was just too uh, I, I totally concur yeah he was just a, such Which a why he's not here. yeah just, yeah <laughs> i mean he just he had such a such a pure personality to him that you could genuinely tell he truly did care about the fans and like we were talking about today being at the shows and they were the grateful dead has all only been and to this day still only been the band that i've seen in concert repeatedly that encouraged the fans right down the set list you know, tape our music, record us, share it. It was just mind blowing to go to any other concert and be frisked and told, no, you got to put, you know, throw your camera in the trash. And it's like, what are you kidding me? I can't even take a picture of being here. And of course, now everybody's got cell phones, so it doesn't make any difference. But the Grateful Dead were just so. Hey, record us. We, you know, we'll make room for you. Just, and it was just amazing to me that they were just so open to, hey, we're all in this together. It's like 
like a family gathering. And then the the That's different what it people. Was. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it stayed that way for a long time and despite the you know, complaints of the attorneys, you know, the band just said, No, this is what we want to do. Yeah. Um yeah. Renee who's on Facebook, she said Jerry was needed on the other side, I truly believe. Well, he's needed on the other side, but he hasn't left us. You know, we truly, you know, the ones here on earth are the ones that need him the most. Yeah. You know, to uplift us and, and let us know that we're loved and we have someone to inspire us and to help us. And, you know, that is truly his commitment to be of service, loving, compassionate service to others. And it is just amazing, the stories. After I wrote the book, I had so many beautiful stories of people who had their experiences with Jerry, you know, when he was alive mm -hmm. you know, and after his death. And it was just, you know, they were so grateful. There's that word again, but they were so grateful that I stepped out and talked about it because they didn't feel alone now. You know, they couldn't talk about their experiences, you know, uh, for other dimensional experiences with Jerry to the friends or to the family because they didn't want their people, their friends and family to think they were crazy. But in, when I came out with the book, they felt such a great relief and support that, you know, they didn't feel crazy anymore. Yeah. Now, on the other side, equally, there were those deadheads that were so irate that I would do something like this. You would not believe it. I, you know, and I, could, I was I, sort of, I was surprised to take it back at, at how vituperative they were. And they, no one, no one that was angry with me about this wrote to me, I, you know, my email address is in the book, you know, I did over 30 radio interviews, they could get in touch with me, you know, the book was on Amazon, and none of them had the courtesy to either write me a letter or to send me an email, but they went on Amazon. <sighs> and wrote these terrible reviews of me, you know, it's like, and I, you know, I'm not a social media person, and, you know, so I'm not checking out Amazon at the time, and all of a sudden, you know, a friend says, have you seen what's being written to you on Amazon? And I'm going, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> they said, you better check it out, you know. Currently, your rating on, you know, popularity of the book is about one. I'm going, What? And I got on and, you know, because it was a, they, they couldn't confront me personally or directly, even via email, but they could do it on Amazon. And so I said, okay, well, you can play the game too. So I seriously, I called up all my friends, I emailed all my friends. And I said, hey, I need your help. I need you to go on Amazon and just write an honest review of the book and how you feel about it and everything. And that changed everything, you know, and the ratings went up and, you know, there was a voice for the good. Yeah. You know, those people who really benefited from it, along with those, you know, to balance, you know, once again, I love the word balance, but to balance the negative things that were being said by people who felt very threatened by it. I think there is always going to be those creatures. <laughs> I don't care if it's a book, a tire, a shoelace, an ink pen that have to be the first to put a one star this was rotten or this was this could have been better well then if, if it could have been why didn't you do it you know if you have nothing nice well, to say yeah, and part of it, you know <laughs> part of it was so you know how i don't believe you you know how you know prove this you know jerry's dead what do you mean he's talking to you why is he talking to you? Why is he talking to, you know, somebody else kind of thing? You know, so, you know, it's, it's like this did not fit in their box that they had created for Jerry. And see, yeah, as I said, this is back in the late 90s, mid to late 90s and stuff. And, you know, channeling has certainly been around for eons. Oh, yeah. But it wasn't as accepted then as it is now. And really truly threatened by it. Yeah. I would truly, I would truly compare it to 
um, say, playing guitar. You've got those who went and took guitar lessons. You have those who were taught by somebody in their family. You have those who taught themselves. Those who can read music, those who can't read music and play. So, or then the Robert Johnson, maybe they went and made a deal, who knows. But, yeah, it's everybody's got, if they, you know, not every guitar player learned how to play the same instrument the same way. So your gift with Jerry is so unique and so special. Why isn't that believable? You know, that's that my it wouldn't be. How can it be? Mine is why? Why couldn't it be? Yeah, I, why not? You knew him. I mean, it, for well, me, keep it, in mind, you know, there are, there are people out there that aren't totally open to talking to dead people. You know, they have the belief that when you're dead, you're gone. Yeah. There's no life after death. There's no reincarnation. I've, you know, there's no spirit. You know, you're just dead. I've, I've got a paranormal. So if you say, oh, no. Yeah, I've got a paranormal team. So we run into the skeptics, and until something happens to them themselves, then it's, <laughs> it's like, oh, no, no, this stuff's rigged and fake. Fake, and it's like, and you know what? Believe what you want to believe, you know? And then afterwards, it's like, you know, I really didn't think it was real, but um, having some second thoughts now, it's like, have whatever thoughts you want to have, first, second, or third. It's up to you. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not here. A, Go ahead. I was going to say, I have a wonderful story to share about the book being published. Oh, please. After it was written. So, Bob, Bob and I have uh, a literary agent in New York, you know, that we use for our two children's books that were, Panther Dream was released in 1993 and Barrow Bay in 1996. Um, and so I had, you know, as I was writing the book, I contacted Sarah and I said, hey, this is what's going down. And she had dealt with, you know, paranormal stuff before. And she says, yeah, no, keep me posted. I'm certainly open to it. So I said, cool. So I got the draft of the book done and sent it off to her. And she, you know, read through and made comments. I made the changes, all the editorial stuff, sent it back to her. And then it just sat. I didn't hear anything. And I'm going, okay, you know, the other ones at this time were what the odd and the remaining Grateful Dead members were calling themselves. We're going to be in New York. And so, uh, I called up Sarah and I said, hey, the band's going to be there, you know, another, you know, four or five days. It would be great if we could do something, contact the publishers about the book before they get there. And she's going, yeah, yeah, okay, let me see what I can do. I'm really busy right now. And so I dropped it. And lo and behold, wasn't more than two days later, Sarah calls me and says, you are not going to believe what happened to me. I said, what? Oh, boy. She says, I'll be really honest with you. She says, I, you know, wasn't promoting the book. I didn't think people would really, you know, go for it. It's a little out there, you know, and you're making claims about Jerry and talking to you and everything. She said, and I'm not, in, you know, she's not into the spirit stuff, spirit communication a lot, but she does recognize that it's there. She said, I had a dream the other night after we talked and Jerry came to me in the dream and he said, Sarah, get off your ass and get that book published. <laughs> I love it. And he said, she said, I was so shocked and it was so real that when I got up in the morning, I called Harmony Books and I talked to Shay, you know, who is one of the um, publishers there and explained what I had sent her off the draft, and she says, you aren't going to believe this. She says, this has never happened to me before. Within 24 hours, I have I have an offer for you to publish the book. Oh, and wow. And I'm going, wow, you're kidding. She said, no. She says, if it hadn't been for Jerry coming to me in my dream and telling me to get off my ass, I wouldn't have done it. That is and she says, amazing. this is the fastest 
fastest I have ever closed a publishing deal in my life. That is and I was amazing. like, thank you, Jerry. That is amazing. I've got a uh, fellow author, Susan Schwartz, who's uh, watching in on Facebook too, and she's listening. She said, very fascinating. So, I mean, that's, I'm sure she can relate as well as some others um, that are authors too, that it's that whole, it, it's ridiculous. Try If you don't pay for it up front on your own and try to do it, then it's hell trying to get published. I well, helped work on well, some. Yeah, back then, there, yeah, there wasn't as much of the self-publishing opportunities as there are nowadays. So you were really dependent upon, you know, if you're going to get the book out there, having a publisher do it. Yeah. You know, and that's changed a lot now, unfortunately, which is great. But if it, it's truly, if it hadn't been for Jerry telling Sarah to wake up and get going, she wouldn't have done it. That, so, that is so amazing. We, we, Sarah and I both laugh. Yeah. So amazing. I just, I love, I love, love, love to hear something like that because it just, especially, you know, when it comes from someone who's not as involved in spirit and clairvoyancy and the different clairs, clairaudiency, clairvoyancy, and so on. And they're more, you know, okay, I need it on paper. I need to see it, touch it, feel it, <laughs> to believe it, you know, type to have that kind of a experience and go okay and we're gonna make this happen and then boom it happens and <laughs> that's amazing yeah that truly is amazing yeah yeah it, it, it was amazing you know once again thank you jerry because he really wanted to see the book out there now and all right i want to go backwards just a, a hair because I want to lead into asking you something else but tell the folks about Otis so you know I may not be addressing everything that's in the book but I will certainly tell you about Otis so Otis was Bob's dog and uh, this goes back into the oh geez 80s you know Late, late 70s or so, um, Otis and Bob sort of adopted each other, and they were alter egos. And it, it was just, they were so close on a very deep, deep, deep level, you know, and, and they would both, you know, pull stunts and get into mischief in their own right. You know, Otis has his own, you know, little routines and trouble that he'd get into. Bob get into his trouble with, you know, but they had a great time together. And every so often, Bob would bring Otis to the shows, and Otis would, you know, hang out and have a good time and do what he wanted to do. Um, but when, before one of the shows, I mean, we're talking Otis is now, what, uh, so Otis looks like a mix between a Husky and a Nikita. And, you know, just a total love. He was beige with curly, you know, uh, sort of a tail with a curl on it. Oh. He just, you know, was just so precious. Such a great dog. And he lived to be, God, I want to say between 14 and 16 years of age. It was sort of indeterminate about when he was born. But he lived to a real old, old age. And before... Bob was in, in concert. He was playing shows. You know, the dead were in concert over in Oakland, Oakland Auditorium. And Otis was just, he was fading. And he was in so much pain. And Bob just said, it's time. And I came over to the house, you know, and was there with them. And, uh -huh. you know, he had called the vet to come over to the house yeah. to put the dog down. And the vet had said, I can't be there until after work. And 
father's gone. I have to leave at four o'clock to be at a show in Oakland to sound check. And the vet said, I'm sorry, I can't. I just cannot be there. And Bob said, okay. And he waited. And he waited until the vet came. Now, the sound check comes and goes. The doors are open. The band is supposed to start. And Bob is still waiting for the vet. Wow. In Mill Valley. So we're talking like, you know, 45 minute drive away from the shows. And, you know, the manager and everybody's going, hey, where are you? Hey, where are you? You know, Bob's sort of talking to the mom and hey, we're here. And the vet finally came and we put Otis down. And, uh, you know, the vet took him to, you know, mm -hmm. to treat him and all of those things. And I got in the car and drove Bob over to the show. Uh, and it was, you know, the show started late, of course. And all the band members knew what had happened. The audience did. Mm -hmm. And it was top, it was the first and the only show that Bob ever performed where he did not sing one song. He was so distressed. It was so painful and overwhelming for him to lose his buddy that he just, he, he had no voice. He could not give it words. Okay. And, okay. you know, after... Yeah, after that, I did a picture of Otis and Otis having transitioned on and the message that came to me. And it was sort of like, you know, uh, from another, another being, another, another world and another planet. And this had been, Otis had been in another dimension, one of Bob's very, very dear, close, close friends who wanted to be with Bob in this lifetime but didn't want to go through all of the pain and suffering on earth. And so he decided to come into this dog bee called Otis to be with Bob and to you know, be there and support him on this earth walk as long as he could. Yeah. So it was, it's, it's an amazing story. Bob has, you know, certainly he and, and Natasha's wife and his girls, you know, they're now grown, um, but they have dogs. But there's never been a dog like Otis for Bob. Well, you're the the one year anniversary of his passing, and that experience that you had just was mind blowing to me. It was because I'm a animal lover. I've had dogs, cats. I mean, just somehow they find me, and or it just so happens, and you know, and they've always had their own special personalities and it's like, okay, well, I know why you showed up when you showed up and, you know, but that experience that you had that one year anniversary, if you don't mind sharing that story. Um, I, I would actually have to go back to the book. Can you trigger my mind on that? Um, the painting. Right. That was, um, you know, just communicating about Otis coming down, you know, as this really close friend of Bob who wanted to be with him on Earth, but not, you know, incarnate on Earth. So, um, yeah, Bob still has the painting hanging in his studio. Yeah. I mean, I just, but, I thought that was uh, you know, but, so precious. But, yeah, there, you know, that's, that's not the only animal story, too. There's another one that's just in the book too, but it's about uh, the wolves up at Bob's house. Now Bob lives on Mount Tamalpais on, on the side of Mount Tam. He's been, still on the same house that he's had since 1971. Mm. Um, it's gone through various iterations, but when I went up, this is after, you know, Otis passed, Bob was really distressed and everything. I went up to the house, Bob was off on tour, and I went up to the house too. You know, check on things and take care of stuff. And I'm walking up the steps because on it on the slope. I'm walking up the steps of the house. Um, I'm about eye level with the porch, the deck. And these two vicious spirit wolves, you know, drooling mm. saliva, red eyes are charging towards me and it's nighttime and I'm going, Oh, oh my god, what is going on here? And it's like, okay, I know this isn't spirit. 
put up a blockade, you know, an energetic barrier, so that they couldn't get to me. And they stopped right at the porch, right at the, at the edge of the deck and the steps. And I said, look, you know, I'm here. I'm Bob's sister. I'm here. I'm a lot of keys. I'm checking on stuff. It's okay. Will you please let me in? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you know, they're hostage, you know. Yeah. And, you know, they did. And so I was able to go in and check on stuff, and they stayed around. And it was, they had been attracted by Bob's trauma. And in other lifetimes, Bob, you know, had worked with um, wolf spirit guides, you know, and been a druid and other things. Mm -hmm. So these were here, they were present to protect him was, and his place. Yeah, I was going to say, and, I mean, the Native American culture, it's when the the wolves are the land protectors and yeah that's that's amazing yeah and so i told i told bob about it and he totally believes it you know he said yeah yeah they were there so what's been what was fascinating over the years is that time to, from time to time it's like chloe is um, bob's youngest daughter and when she was probably Oh, in elementary school, you know, she would have her friends over and stuff. And one of them looked out the window one night and saw the wolves. And she's going, oh, Chloe, Chloe, oh, my God, this is what I see. You know, Chloe calls me up and she says, you aren't going to believe it, that she saw the wolves. And it's like, so the wolves, you know, are still there. They aren't ferocious like they used to be. Bob doesn't need that protection like he did at that time. But they're still protecting the property. Wow. That is, well, it's spirit. And he, I love the fact that you, now, does your other brother, does he feel the same way about spirit? And John is, um, you know, our older brother. And um, I would say he is very Christian. Mm -hmm. And we don't talk. We don't talk about it. He is deeply loving, and very much. You know, all three of us are very, very close. And um, but I don't. He doesn't say gay or nay, but we don't talk about. It. Okay. Do you notice anybody else in the family having the same kind of gifts like that you have, or that Bob has? Oh yeah, I know you said his daughter. Uh, that Chloe had seen the wolf too. Um, probably, well, I mean, it, it's family. I mean, Bob's wife, Natasha, has certainly has, you know, developed her abilities over the years, you know, beautifully. And um, Chloe has an interest in all of this. Chloe's now 20. Um, and Monet, you know, is certainly aware and open about all of this. So I don't. I wouldn't say that they've developed it to the extent that I have, but they're certainly open to all of this and can communicate about it. And, you know, of course, Bob's right there with me in all of this stuff, too. He has his, as I said, he has his own experiences, and some of them are shared and some of them won't share. Um, but he's very much into, you know, uh, in, you know, the universality of life and consciousness and spirit. Yeah. Now I have in, and I know this is probably going to come up because being able to have, well, God, I got like I feel like I've got a thousand questions to ask you. Um, but in the process of writing the book and hearing from Jerry, but I I'd have to backtrack also about the Oversoul, which I want you to explain too. But have you actually? Seen Jerry visually? Um, I see Jerry in, an, in his etheric body. I don't experience Jerry in the physical. Okay. I mean, and there is there are some you know certainly gurus that have experiences of you know deceased people coming to them in you know the physical body, and you can touch them or by locating uh, and stuff like that. I don't. But I do see Jerry in, the, in his astral body, his etheric body, it's just like his energy body. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it varies because Jerry is more than uh, just the Jerry Garcia born here and living on Earth and dying in, you know, August 9th, 1995. Yeah. Jerry is so much more than that. We're all so much more than who we are in this physical body at this time. And so there would be times when I would see Jerry as a wayfarer, and you know, or you know, a wayfarer wanderer. I 
service and help in the world evolution. So like, you know, a commitment was made to come to Earth to help in humanity evolve. And we are currently at the time of ascension, which is an awesome time, a very powerful time. And each of us will be ascending in our own way and in our journey. But Jerry came here to help with that. And that was a commitment he made as a wanderer. You know, and he goes to other worlds too and other planets to help also. So uh, sometimes he comes to me in sort of the uniform of a wanderer. And sometimes he comes to me, you know, as Jerry, as we know him, you know, on Earth you know, at this time. Mm -hmm. So it varies. Sometimes he's just a being of light. Yeah. I mean, he just, he, it, when you look at pictures of him throughout the years and things and the way he, his physical body changed, um, I, you know, even that is amazing in itself that someone might think of Jerry Garcia and picture 60s, Haight Ashbury, Jerry Garcia. Someone like myself um, is going to picture, you know, the Jerry in his 40s. And, yeah, and with the graying hair and, like, you know, and I'll, I'll have to share a funny story with you. At one point in time, I was working at 7-Eleven. Please don't sue me, 7-Eleven, for the story I'm about to say. <laughs> but um, there was the Jerry Lewis Marathons. And we got rolls of stickers that said, I'm one of Jerry's kids. And if you gave a donation, you got a sticker. So I may or may not have taken a roll or two of these stickers with me to a show <laughs> just walked around and just kind of met people and just it was entertaining to see people going, oh, where'd you get that sticker? Have you, have you got another one? Yeah. And people actually socializing and being asked by people as they're walking around. How many kids does Jerry have? And it was like, <laughs> sorry, oh no. <laughs> what kind of horrible rumor am I starting? Please don't be mad. <laughs> but it was, you know, it was just the most opportune thing to do. And then ran out of stickers and was at that show with several friends. And we all kind of got lost away from each other which wasn't any big deal even though we were you know hundreds of miles away from home at a concert with our car parked god knows where at this point and my friend and i happened to walk right up to each other and another woman walked up and she goes you know you two met right back where you were supposed to see the sign behind you be an infinite circle. And I was like, Wow. Okay. That's that's pretty cool. Uh and he and I just looked at each other and he goes, I guess we're gonna be friends forever, huh? And I went, Yeah, I think you're stuck with me. And we still are. We still are friends. That's wonderful. Yeah, so it just all these I don't know how to say it other than magical, electrical, mystical moments that would happen at these shows were just unlike anything I ever experienced with any other band. And it was always something so special and unique. And like being at one show, and they played Ripple, which I knew that they hardly ever played. And it was like, oh, my God, that's the gem in my crown of concerts right now. 
and will always be. And it was because there was someone, a longtime fan, who was there that they recognized that was Pat, was very, very terminally ill. And they played Ripple. And that was like, you just knew by looking at all the other fans and especially the uh, more seasoned, I won't call them older, the more seasoned fans um, would just look and just had this beautiful, you know, it was like a bittersweet smile on their face, like, okay, we know this is significant. And the younger ones kind of like, what's the big deal with this song? And me being somewhere in between, it was like, wow, this is one of those moments I'm not ever, ever, ever going to forget. So it was. It's, it, yeah, it's interesting because for the band, they did have one song that they played when someone very close to them, including Otis, um, passed away. And the song is He's Gone. And so they would play that. And yet with Ripple, which the lyrics were written by Robert Hunter, mm -hmm. and, you know, of course, sung by Jerry. For Hunter, that song meant, you know, was, was very deeply part of transformation. He played it at the death of his mother, and he played it at the death of his father. And for me, when I hear the lyrics that are, I agree with you, it's one of my you know, top songs you know, Grateful Dead songs, mm -hmm. they uh, speak of transformation and beauty and light. Yeah. And it's, it's very deeply moving, um, just beautiful. It, it is. It's it's one of the most precious songs I think of. I don't think I could picture anybody but Jerry singing it. It was just, I mean, perfect lyrics and just the perfect song for him to sing and i know when he passed it just I, to, I hear, to hear that last line if i knew the way i would take you home it was just ah oh, that right after he passed it was like oh this is too hard to listen to but over time it's like wait a minute you never really left I can still hear your yeah. voice, you know, I still hear your voice. I can still see you. Thanks to other fans that recorded videos and whatnot. Of some of the shows that I was even at, it's like, that's the show I was at. I can, I'm reliving that moment in time again. And, you know, but so for those who don't know, Tell them about what the Oversoul, because I found that fascinating. The how the, the stubbornness. So the, the, <laughs> um, yeah, so the Oversoul, we all are energy being beings of light, and we also come from a a, a higher group consciousness. So, which, you know, has different names. Um, I use the one Oversoul. And in that group consciousness, we have a shared consciousness. So, you know, and as you raise in frequency, mm -hmm. that you always maintain your individual consciousness. You know, we're like a fractal of source of the, of the, the one consciousness that breaks into fractals of consciousness. So each of us are our own consciousness, which we retain for eternity. And we're still part, though, as we raise in frequency to a oneness of, you know, shared vibration, basically. And so there are different levels of overstall, but the, there's, you know, I look at it as just one uh, primary, like an umbrella, incorporating so many different lives and experiences and beings, and like it's a sense of. Uh, awareness and family and familiarity and um, oneness. I mean, when I, the whole you know, Bob's business manager at the time, Goldie, you know, we're going back into the 70s and 
80s here. And Goldie was reading this book called um, Oversoul 7. I'm going, Goldie, what on earth is that? She says, oh, you got to read it. And I swear, I read it a couple of times and so I'm like, uh, this isn't making me a lot of sense to me. But over the years, I have a better understanding of, you know, the higher frequencies of consciousness carrying a oneness. And there's also a love and uh, a compassion as we raise in frequency that, that binds us, that we still keep our individuality. I love it. I should probably go back and read over Soul 7 again <laughs> <to get laughs> and see what I make of it. But uh, it was really interesting. That's how I got introduced to the concept with Drew Golding. That's that's amazing, yeah. Because you hear, you know, I know I've I've heard many people talk about you know raising their frequency, raising the vibration. And it's like, of course, you know, you've got to ground yourself. You've got to work. You can't. And I have to remind myself too, with helping others, you can't pour from an empty cup. I've got to keep my cup full, and then I can help others but in doing so I've got to fill my cup with something that's good I've got to raise me to a, a better place stay grounded so I can be able to help others because it does it is fulfilling and it should be fulfilling I think that's what I probably miss the most about being at some of the shows and things just that energy that you're talking about and that it was such a powerful energy of just love and compassion and empathy and oneness that we're all here together why would anybody want to hurt anyone else you know it was just such a beautifully said just such a, a, a a wonderful place to be that you couldn't wait to get there and you couldn't you didn't want that you had to be dragged back to your car <laughs> to have to leave and it was like I don't want to go I don't want this part to end and then sharing the you know different who did you meet well who did you meet and what did you do and where did you disappear to and I just remember you know I mean at one show um walking around and you know be before the second day's show and walking around and i happen to be a smoker and this fellow walks up and he says you know can i do you have an extra cigarette i could have and i said sure and he said what do i owe you and i said nothing and he said, no, sharing is caring. And he said, you've been walking for a while, haven't you? And I said, yeah. And he goes, well, my name's Thumper. And I said, okay, my name's Sherry. And he said, come over here and sit on the hill. Let me rub your feet. Mom, I smoked a cigarette that you gave me. And I thought, what a cool thing this is that's happening right now to me. I mean, just someone willing, I'm thinking, you really want to rub my feet? I mean, my, I've got tennis shoes and sweaty socks on. <laughs> you want to rub my feet? You can just have a cigarette. <laughs> it's not a big deal. But it was, he was just so intent on, no, you know, to show that you care, you share, and you share because you care. So I, I can't just take and not give back. You've been on your feet, so let me give back. And I was like, okay. And I gotta admit, I mean, it wasn't a very long cigarette, but it felt like the foot massage. And we just chatted, and it. And then he finished the cigarette, and I took the cigarette butt up because it was like, no, we're not leaving trash on the ground. And he thanked me, and off he went, just like bumper from you know just off he bounced and gave a wave and I didn't see him again and I thought 
you know, now that was such a cool experience for something just over a cigarette where now if you approached anybody for, you know, hey, can I, can I bum a, a quarter from you? It, they would look at you and just walk past you just as fast as possible. Like, you know, what? No. And it's like, where did that just general compassion go that for each other and, you know, hey, what do you need? You know, how can I help? And if I can help you, you know, I don't need you to help me, but that willingness to just want to equally, you know, well, I want a cigarette. You may need a foot rub. Yeah. And it was just something so sporadic and random, but yet I have not forgotten it. And that was in the 80s. So. And, and that's still applies to today. We have to be we get back to you know helping others that is so important and reciprocating yeah and appreciating and recognizing yeah that is so important i think that's what probably led me into wanting to even though i myself have got some disabilities um i still enjoy well enjoy is probably not the right term but i like to be of service for people who need um, a caregiver. And it's meant a lot to me to be called on to be asked, you know, hey, my mother's dealing with Alzheimer's or in my own family, my aunt dealing with Alzheimer's until they pass. And being able to be there for them and get in, the, you know, put a bathing suit on and get in the shower with them and help them take a bath or feed them, help, you know, make their meals and feed them and things like that. Um, yeah, it's, it's just, it's meant a lot to me to be able to give back because I think of, you know, these wonderful people that have grown older and it's like, they provided me with so much how could I not want to be there to help them when they don't, they're not able to help mm -hmm. themselves, you know? So yeah, it's just, I think of that as like the, the Grateful Dead philosophy of life. If, if the Grateful Dead had a, you know, guidebook, that would be rule number one, you know, help others, <laughs> be kind to others, you know, just show Shows the yeah, and, and also family. Yeah. You know? Family is more than just, you know, who you're born with. You know, and the importance of family and being there for one another. Yeah. Finding your your tribe, so to speak, you know. Yeah, and you know, it's fascinating because if you go to the shows nowadays, yes, they're different. Um, but there are multiple generations I mean, I was in Chicago for the, the you know, last of the, quote, Grateful Dead shows and, you know, the dream of the, what, what is it? Oh, fairly well. That was it. And I was just blown away. I, you know, was wandering out in the audience and just looking at all of the generations of people that were there, including little babies. Oh. And then listening to people talk and, you know, they divided themselves into... Just, just with their conversation, it wasn't any, you know, judgment or anything. But, yeah. You know, the pre jerrys who knew Jerry and heard him sing and went to some of the shows and all this stuff, and the ones after Jerry who really wanted to understand what it was like to be in that vibration of, you know, peace, and harmony, and oneness, and love, and all of that. And everybody was seeking that vibe for what the, the dead were known for. And it was just, it was beautiful. It was amazing. Yeah. It really lives on. That spirit lives on. Oh, it does. It does. And um, Renee here on uh, Facebook has said many shows, other, others fed her, gave her drinks, etc. Those were the best times of my teenage years in the 90s. So, yeah, I mean, it, you know, again, it's just, it was like a, 
just an understanding that everyone had with with one another that um just that spirit that you know i don't i don't know the right words to say i mean other than it was just a unwritten and unspoken mind frame of you know hey we're all here together as one look out for each other just be kind to each other love one another be good to each other treat each other with generosity and compassion support each other show goodwill and just the way they the band you know your brother included i mean just they all always gave you could tell they gave everything they had at the shows and it was just how could you not just absolutely love that back and just want to and want to you know, grab the person next to you by the arms and go, did you just hear them? You know, <laughs> did you just see that? You know, are you experiencing the same thing as me? I mean, oh my God, can you believe where we are? And, and the kind of energy that's in here in, in this building or in this arena, it was just phenomenal. So what, what kind of... Yeah, and that lives on within each of our hearts. That, that's always a part of, you know, what's with us is who we are and that we carry forward and that the music carries forward. Oh, yeah. You know, we're, we're, this is in the spirit. And this is the ease of Jerry's passing. And all of that is still alive now within each of us. So what would you say are some of the very clear messages that, Jerry had for uh, the band, the band members, and for the fans, or the general public, society. Uh, I just handed you a loaded, yeah, that was a loaded question, huh? <laughs> yeah, no, I'll just, I'll share some of the, just a few of the odds and ends not necessarily in the book and stuff. Um, you know, Billy Kreutzman, who's one of the drummers for the band, and mm -hmm. I was talking to him after one of the shows several years after, kind of maybe four or five years after Jerry had passed, and, you know, the book had come out, so he was certainly aware that I'd written it. And he sort of pulled me aside. He says, hey, Wendy, and I said, yeah, Billy. He says, I got to tell you. He said, after Jerry died, he came to me, and he told me to go to Hawaii to get out of here and get away from all of this craziness and just to go to Hawaii. And he said, I did. And it's been the best thing I've done. And, and Billy still lives in Hawaii. Oh, so wow. Went, but, you know, and, and he always, Billy always loved the scuba diving, you know, and the water sports and all of that. But the reason he left the area, uh, the Bay Area, and moved to Hawaii was because Jerry came to in a dream and told him, hey, do this. Wow. So it was really special. Oh yeah. And you know, Jerry is very, Jerry is very much, you know, a part of Bob. And I, I say that from an energetic and a frequency level, where I actually did some energy work with Bob, and after Jerry passed away, and brought Jerry into Bob's team and uh, his energy field. And Bob will tell you even now that Jerry is a part of him, and Jerry is. When Bob plays the music and, you know, is on stage, Jerry is not only outside of him and with everybody else, but he's also within Bob. And that Bob actually grounds Jerry's spirit present on the earth. You know, it would be harder for Jerry to be present and, and you know, with a heart of compassion and service as much as he is if he did not have a something to ground him here in the physical and he is able to do that through Bob. Yeah. So it's uh, there there's just a closeness between the two that is at a very
very, very profound level and continues and will always be there. You could definitely see that in here in life while he was still here. The way the, the two could look at each other, play off of each other, just read each other without having to say a mm -hmm. word. They just, it was like you could just see them look at each other and it was like they were just telepathically speaking, saying, you ready to hit that note? You ready to grab that and go to this part? And yep, yep, yep. And it, the way they flowed together, you just, it, it, the way they intertwined, I guess is probably the best way I could put that. They just intertwined with one another so well. There was never a, a knot. It was just, just constantly flowing with each other. And it was so, so amazing especially to witness it live in front of you, you know? I mean, pictures are great, but when you're live and you're right there and you're seeing it happen and unfold and you think, wow, to have that kind of chemistry and connection with another person that intense is just amazing. It is. And it's just... What would... What are some messages that Jerry's given you for society? Or has he? Um, I, you know, and I'll just say this um, in general, but he really, in, once again, it's in the book, but uh, getting back to drugs, I mean, heavy drugs, mm. you know, and that includes, you know, addictions, it includes alcohol. Anything that changes your frequency and lowers it and deadens you and hurt in essence hurts you. Mm -hmm. You know, Jerry was was subject to all of that in this lifetime when he was alive and you know, he had a lot of you know, he had trauma from watching his father die and um, you know, people it, it's really hard when you're famous because people want to get close to you and so they give you all these you know, drugs and say, Hey, try this or hey, try that. Jerry has, it was totally incapable of saying no. So, you know, it's like, oh, great, okay, yeah, I'll try this, I won't do that, you know. And you, you end up getting hooked and addicted. And he's really, you know, like that holds you back. And if you really want to move forward in life and really shine your light and be clear and raise your frequency, you know, you can't do that with drugs. Yeah. And so that's something that he was really aware of on the other side. Because once you pass over, you aren't, you know, subject to the anything physical, you know, no heroin, no alcohol. Um, oh, so you course. can really see how it impacted your life while you were alive. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, you so that, think about the, you know, the time the times that they were in, you know, uh, Woodstock and acid and I mean, even being announced, don't eat the brown, don't take the brown acid, don't take the brown acid. I mean, it's just, it was a thing. And, you know, of course, young ones, they get creative. I mean, I hear of, I don't know what, if whatever the new thing is now that you know, taking so many of over-the-counter different things, and it's like, are you kidding me? Uh, why would you go to the trouble to do stuff like this? I mean, the shows that I remember so vividly, there were no, there was no influence. The influence was the energy and and the the sight and sounds and smells and the laughter and and music and it was just why would you want to be so messed up that you would not be able to remember that I'm not saying people didn't offer it or have it around me but I mean it was just 
yeah, did I dabble with it growing up too? Yeah, but um, I'm so thankful that I didn't stay there. You know, because it just, I would not want to not remember these special moments. Does that make Clearly. sense? You know, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's just uh, like having sunglasses on in a dark room. Why would you, you know, I, I don't, I want to be able to see. I want to, I want to remember this. I don't want to be in a fog or in a haze or in a daze or, you know, a year later go, I was at that show? Really? You know, uh, so... <laughs> Um, you know, and, and one other thing, and, and likewise, like the Palestinian stuff, it opened up many people's minds with a very expansive experience. Mm -hmm. What has been interesting over the years is um, the aging process and the toll that it takes on women's body. I mean, Bob, you know, along with the rest of the band and stuff, mm -hmm. they all were talk about psychedelics, oh my God. You know, they're all totally into it. That was their lifestyle. And it, now as they have aged, they they can't, you know, they don't do that anymore. The body is saying, like, no, uh-huh, you know, yeah. I can't handle this. I don't want it. And so, you know, they're, they're listening to that, and they aren't using it. And they're really cleaning up their act. And so that, you know, with Dead and Company, the Nikki and the Billy and the, you know, body that you see on stage are in a really good place. You know, there's a lot of clarity there, a connection to spirit to one another that they were not, they did not accomplish in their younger years. And I get back to the word clarity. There is a clarity there and a, a working together and an understanding that they did not have when they were younger. And that just comes from maturing and, and the wisdom of the body. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, Renee on Facebook has got a question for you. Is there anything Jerry may have regretted not doing? Um, that, you know, I'm checking in with him now. So only he can answer that. Um, <laughs> he, he wishes he could have said no more often. It's a hard thing to do with somebody with a big heart, though. For the generous part. Oh, absolutely. It's a very hard thing to do. Absolutely. You know, but from, from the world of spirit, you know, it's okay to say no because you need to choose what is best for you. This is your life and your journey. With total respect to all the other beings out there, but you need to make decisions that are best for you. And he just wishes he had had the ability to, to say no at times. And he's saying there are other ones too, but he's not getting into it. <laughs> uh, why do I just hear a chuckle? <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, I just I hear that laughter like. Not, not, for, not for the public. <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, and there's a few more, but not for this show, no. <laughs> I'm I'm just so amazed, right? I mean, I'm so amazed at your abilities, and is would it be horrible for me to ask? Is Jerry okay with you having done the show with me this evening? He or, told me to do it. I, uh, as I mentioned when I called you, I know. you know, this morning, I said, hey, I'll do it. You know, it's, I said, hey, Jerry. He says, yeah, do it. You know, he wants to be heard, too. He wants, um, once again, to reinforce the message of oneness and joy and creativity and service to others. All of the things that the dead stood for are still really important for us in our society. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, so the message lives on. It's not dead. You know, and he wants it heard. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
All right, I'm going to throw the trivia question out. And for those listening on Blog Talk or looking at Blog Talk online or are on Facebook or YouTube, the trivia question is, what is the name of, what is the name the Grateful Dead used I mentioned earlier this evening that they used to come to Virginia to play under, and it was their original name. And I will give it to, well, never mind, <laughs> Renee Cody, the Warlocks. Very good. And so I will, Renee, I will um, email Wendy your mailing info so she can mail you an autographed copy of this book. You are going to love this book, Renee. Renee is one of my dedicated um, listeners on Haunted Tales, and she's also a teacher, bless her heart. So, and I proud deadhead so <laughs> yeah, yay. yeah so um and she's been at the one asking so many questions and sharing so much you know that ripple is an awesome song and she always saw him as Sam, always pictured jerry garcia as santa claus saw him as a santa claus oh uh, that's wonderful yeah and i could I could see that. We, I always just thought of him as like Uncle Jerry. There's a, there's good old Uncle Jerry, you know. And just <laughs> oh, she said, "Thank you, thank you. This means so much. Jerry holds my heart forever." Oh, you are, you're so welcome, Renee. Yeah, but I've actually got the, um, and it's so funny. Wendy and you I don't know if you're you've got the page up but the pictures there's the Hampton Coliseum sign and it was October 8th and 9th the Warlocks this is 1989 October 10th through uh -huh. the 15th Walt, yeah. Walt Disney's rolled on ice <laughs> like oh my it was just hilarious that it was like we all knew Okay, the Warlocks is a Grateful Dead, but really, Disney's following, <laughs> going behind the Grateful Dead. We're going from dancing bears to cartoon characters. I mean, a whole different bunch of different cartoon characters. So it was, yeah, and it was, and Renee just pointed out too, the ticket was eighteen fifty. You know, I mean, it was just, yeah, those were the days. yeah, and then seeing them at RFK Stadium, and that was July 13th, that was a early birthday present to myself in 89, and that was $21 at RFK in up near DC, and I've got the picture of the uh, shirt, Steal Your Face shirt. That is the shirt I have on. That's the shirt I have on tonight. I have that shirt. I, I was sitting here tonight going through like six or seven different shirts. And I'm going, which one? Do, no, this is the one that meant the most. That summer of 88. So, yeah. The, and I always love the uh, the meaning behind that steal your face. Um song too that it was quite the little bit back and forth about um wow they're just wanting to control everything that we do <laughs> and it just yeah they were such the the group all together i mean just the perfect combination of the perfect individuals to come together. Now, how did how did Bob meet Jerry? 
or ha uh, and, and how did you... was and, teaching guitar in Palo Alto, and um, Bob, so uh, Bob had gotten, had turned on to a guitar, this was like when he was 13, um, it was at a Christmas, and my parents had invited the son of friends of theirs, who was at Fort Ord, which is an ar was an army base down in Monterey. And they invited them up for a couple of days to spend the holidays with us. And this, you know, young man had, you know, brought an acoustic guitar with him. Mm -hmm. And so he sat down and Bob looked at it. And, you know, we had our, each had our obligatory year of piano growing up. Um, but Bob just looked at the guitar and picked it up and became enraptured with it. And so the young man, you know, taught him a few chords and, how to play it, and Bob just was really focused on it and wanted to have more lessons. And so, over the years, you know, this is like Bob ended up going off to school, different places. Yeah. <laughs> but when he was, you know, um, back in back home for a while, and he, you know, my mother looked around and found a guitar teacher at Ada Morgan's in Palo Alto, which is about 10 15 minute drive from where we lived and it was near the stables stanford stables where i had my horse and so uh she would you know take bob and you know we'd go together and she would you know drop bob off at dana morgan for his guitar lesson and then take me to the stables and then you know when i was done writing and stuff after several hours she picked me up and come back and take bob up you know this is like when he's 15 14 15. And so he started playing with, with Jerry, uh, you know, as an instructor. And, you know, that was it, basically. Wow. Um, once Bob turned 16 and got his driver's license, he was over there more and more and at home less and less. Uh, once again, uh, finally dropped out of high school because it was too boring for him and he had other things with his life that he wanted to do. He did get an honorary degree from uh, high, from one of the high schools that he attended, though, so he does have a high school diploma. But he's truly a genius. He is a brilliant, brilliant person, and he has dyslexia. And it was just, it made no sense to him why he needed to be in school when he had all these other things he was passionate about. Yeah. So he met Jerry from an early age, and you know, the band dog, you know, Kreutzmann and Phil and Pigpen at the time, they all ended up getting together in the house of Palo Alto and starting to play as, you know, Mother McCree's Uptown Jug Band, and then that morphed into the Warlocks, and that eventually morphed into the Dead. I can only imagine what your your youth and your your young life was, getting being around these people. I mean, did, did it? How did it affect you being around and getting to know people like Pigpen, who dated Jan or was involved with Janis Joplin, and you've got Jimi Hendrix in there? And I mean, did it was it surreal for you at the time, or was it just well, this is just like going to the grocery store, you know, or whatever, just another you know, a bunch of crazy friends of, you know, my brothers. Yeah, I mean, it was the latter. <clears throat> Excuse me, more like it. I had my own interests. Um, um, as I said, you know, I, you know, I was the responsible one and the organized one and the good little girl and I never really rebuilt. And, you know, so uh, these were just, you know, friends of my brothers. At that time, they didn't have the reputation they had many, many years later. Yeah. Um, I love their music. I'm not a deadhead. Um, they're just family. You know, they used to come over to our house and rehearse. And, you know, it was at a time early enough, when, you know, in the day before the, you know, the neighbors wouldn't complain. But <laughs> it was just like these were family. So if there was none of that sense of wonder or awe they're just like brothers that's amazing that's well renee has got another question for you she said uh, please tell me jerry loves his jam sessions on the other side 
he's surrounded by so many great musicians on the other side. That is so true, and yes, he does. Absolutely, all the musicians here. I mean, if you could just imagine, I'm using my imagination now, the quality of music and the fun that they have is mind-boggling. So yeah, he, he loves it. I could only imagine, because I grew up originally in Alexandria, Virginia, and I lived on the same street as Mama Cass, and... Ah was enrolled in the same school at, that Jim Morrison graduated from, T.C. Williams. So, and Stuart Copeland from the police is from Alexandria. And then you've got Dave Grohl, who was just across the line from my area um, with the Foo Fighters and Nirvana before that. But, um, and then of course, I lived on a street that was used as one route with President Ford and the Manson family wanted, you know, Ford out of the picture. And that was one of my first, of one of two run-ins with the Manson family in my life, which was crazy and insane. But, um, but yeah, I just, I sit here and think, you know, my God, Jim, Morrison, Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, Jerry Garcia, you know, and the list goes on, you know, Bonzo, uh, just the, the amazing band that there must be in heaven right now. Yeah. <laughs> just, oh, and I just, and that precious handprint of Jerry's you know it, it's that precious handprint that he could leave on everybody's heart that was unique to he and he alone when you saw that handprint painted yeah. on anything you knew exactly who it was if you knew who Jerry was yeah so it was yeah. like that was his way of always kind of the way I always thought about uh, he that's his way of putting his fingerprint on your heart in his, <laughs> you know, in his own unique way, it was like, yeah, that's why that, that part's missing, because I left that fingerprint on your heart, there's the rest of my hand, you know, <laughs> so it was like, oh, I know where that, that fingerprint is, it's right here, you know, right here in my heart. Yeah. Yeah, so, what are, what do you think he would I don't know what what would he want to share with people today here now or as far as in um, okay so I'm checking yeah I'm checking in with Jerry and he basically has one word and that is love I love that yeah that's what, what we need to share. That's what we need to have for ourselves. We need to love ourselves. We need to love others. Yeah. You know, love, love is truly the source of what makes the universe, you know, go round, so to speak. It's, uh, Absolutely. it's part of a higher power that is just, that we all have within us and it's all around us. Absolutely. I mean, it makes the world a much better place to be in when there's love being shared out rather than finding things to argue and fuss about or complain about it's, you know just you know just such a different way to look at life that I guess we all have to practice you know as I had one person tell me years ago, was, was you know, be careful what you ask for because you got to earn it. If you want patience, you're gonna be, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna learn how, what patience is when you get stuck in that traffic jam for an hour. Are you how patient are you? <laughs> and it's like, okay, well, you know what? I'm learning patience because um, 
very thankful that I'm not the one that's in the accident, that I'm in the traffic jam behind them. And I hope that they're okay, you know, that kind of thing. So, yeah, it's, it's little things like that, like you were saying, you know, you've got to get, you got to be grateful. Grateful for all the little things. Yeah. Yeah. Have you thought about writing a another yeah. another addition to the? Um, I, I it sort of was alluded to after I wrote you know the first book and um, nothing has happened with it. Um, it's for me to write a book. I you know like this. I need to be totally inspired. You know, and motivated by spirit. Yeah. So, with you know, in the spirit, I was deeply motivated, highly motivated by Jerry's spirit wanting to come through, and it's like merciless. Um, and I'm so glad it happened, and you know, he gave me the courage to go forward. I, I had even talked with Bob about it before sending the draft to the literary agent. He says, do it. You know, you're called to do it. Just send it out there. And, you know, whatever happens, happens. I'm going, yeah, you're right. You know. So, oh, how wonderful to have, um, have that support from your brother, too, you know, from your family. Yeah. And Renee, yeah. She, she just so, put uh, Jerry's golden rule, be kind, be love, and help out where you can. Perfect. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I yeah, think that's, so, um, yeah. Yeah, so, there's, so there's no book in the offing, you know, unless it comes to me and it's like, you know, you need to do this and then I'll go, absolutely. But without that inspiration, um, I, you know, I'm not just going to sit and talk about stuff. So I need to have that motivation of spirit that comes through me to everybody, to the world, to everyone who reads it. So, uh, I can, I can tell you. Who knows what the future brings? Exactly. Exactly. I mean, I can attest to that myself because I had a totally different show planned for tonight and you were a wonderful gift and surprise and mind-blowing moment today for me that I'm telling you, if you, your ears didn't go, whoa, that, what is that squealing sound? <laughs> Where is it coming from? It was just, oh my God. I mean, I wanted to share your book so badly and celebrate, you know, not, not just remember Jerry and in memory, but celebrate him and the, the person that he was, the artist and your the conversations that he shared with you and for people to carry on keep going do things that matter and then all of a sudden it's yeah you know, and i just kept reading that and i was so inspired it was like i'll make this work i'll i people just need to remember him don't let him be forgotten it was his 80th birthday come on let's do this let's do this and then boom my phone rings and I didn't hear it ring and then I saw your email and I read, heard the voicemail and I'm like this cannot have just happened oh my god moment so <laughs> and it was like and then talk well, it was it was meant to be you know there's, there's a higher power at work here because everything came together with very little time of planning yeah you're absolutely right I'm telling you when we talked about it earlier today and I was like, well, I had one thing planned, but we will wing it. If you're willing and able, I am, I'm willing and able to do the best I can <laughs> and get through this, you know, and, uh, because I just treasure this opportunity with you because of how gifted and what a, what a precious gift that you have. And that you're willing to share that with everyone else. And how could I hold on to something like that and not want to share 
that out with others, especially when your gift involves someone who inspired me to do better in my life and that I enjoyed in my lifetime and still remains, they still remain the gem, the crown jewel in my crown of concerts. I mean, just how could I not want to have you on this show? And when you said you were willing, it was like, oh, this is like the Holy Grail. <laughs> <laughs> and in reality, it's just, you know, it's, it's all about spirit. And that, it's, it's truly what makes the world go around. It truly is, you know, what brought this all together. You know, just going back, it, it, look how look all that you went through until you found my email address, which was right there all along. I know. <laughs> which was it. You know, but you didn't see it until like the yesterday. Yeah. So, and I, and it was like, how did these pages, that page not open up before? And it's like, are you kidding me? It was right here. <laughs> and here I've gone around all over the place. And it's like, no. How did this not happen right? Oh, my gosh. But, yeah, you're absolutely right. And like I've said multiple times today, you are so down to earth and I am over the moon on cloud nine tonight. I mean, just. Yeah. <laughs> so. It, it's, it's a perfect combination. Yes. I mean, really and truly, you, it, it has been just such an amazing time talking with you tonight. And what what would you want to share with anybody if they wanted to start? I don't know. How do I want to working on or practicing with their own own gifts? Where what do you recommend that they start with? You, you need to be able to have a clear intent and put the word out there of what you want to do. Um, you know, so whether your gifts be, um, you know, music or art or, you know, talking to dead people or uh, helping others, you know, whatever your gift is, set the intent to expand it, to explore it, to express your spirit, you know, safely. Totally. Safe is a big word I use all the time. Do it safely so that you're protected at all times. And do it from your heart. You know, and with love in your heart. And you know, and, and to do service to others, too. You know, serve yourself. Do service within in your creativity, but also to benefit others and inspire. Wonderfully put. So it's, a, it's the, the, this is a personal journey first, our journey on Earth. Each one of us walks our own path, and then we come together and benefit one another too. So, yeah, uh, you know, be true to yourself. That's, that's important. Yeah, and tell us about the um, the books that you and Bob, your brother, have written together. The children's books. Um, well, we wrote uh, two children's books. One is on the rainforest, one is on uh, the uh, coral reefs in Australia. And, you know, we were both environmentally active, um, Bob more so than I was at the time, and this is going back into the early 90s. And I have a background, I still do, in finance, you know, and, you know, I still have some corporate clients and all of that. So. And I, but I was at the time going, you know, early 90s and going, I need to do something more with my life. And I, you know, I'm, a, I'm created, I'm an artist. I need to be inspired to do my art. I'm not just one of the artists that sits down and draws. I need to have the inspiration. And so I, uh, a friend of Bob said, well, hey, let's do some work with, you know, cats. She had done the makeup for Andrew Lloyd Webber here in the United States for the theatrical production Cats. And she uh -huh. said, why don't you, you know, let's do a coloring book. And, you know, my, our agent, you know, her agent too, she said, oh, that would be fabulous. So I started working on that. Then some things happened and it never came to fruition. So the next project was with Gene Dixon, who at that time uh, 
was um, sort of astrologer and psychic president. And she had articles. I mean, she had her, her astrological paragraphs, forecasts, and all of the page of papers around the U.S. and everything. And so I talked with Jean, and she says, yeah, you know, I really want to do a book about um, my cat, Mike the Magic Cat, because Mike would, you know, always end up over at the White House. The security of the White House knew who belonged to me, and they put him in the car, and they'd send the limo over to my place and let me know that he was coming back. So she says, there's a great story about Mike the Magic Cat. So I did some illustrations that she really, really liked, and then she said, no, I changed my mind. I'm not going to do it on my I think I may focus on my dog. And I'm going, <laughs> okay, this is the second time it's fallen through. So I called up Bob and I said, hey, I really want to do something with my creativity. Get me out of all this banking stuff. You know, not that I was leaving banking, but it would you know, express my spirit of who I was and my creativity. Yeah. And find, help you find that news. About yeah. the environment. And he says, yeah, that would be great. And at that time, he was doing a bunch of stuff with Rainforest Action Network, and mm -hmm. Randy Hayes was the founder of it, and a friend of his, and you know, a friend of mine. And so we, you know, worked on the storyline, and I did the illustrations, and he did the music for it. And because Bob was dyslexic, it was really fascinating because we created a program at that time, which was fairly uncommon that covered all of the senses so not all but, but several so it wasn't you weren't dependent upon reading the book you know you could look at the illustrations you could hear you know the voice over you could dance to the music you know you could you could incorporate all of these different um, learning experiences with it and it was about you know uh, the rainforest and it was located in Africa. It was called Cancer Tree. Wow. And, uh, you know, it was, we had a great time with that. It went over very, very well. And so we thought, okay, well, the next unsung, you know, problem is really with the coral reefs. It's, they're underwater, out of sight, and yet they're being destroyed at an alarming rate. So we ended up going to Australia together along with some friends to do the research on the book and we stayed we met um Mandue Unipingo who has since passed but with Yosu Yindi the Aboriginal rock band over mm -hmm. in Australia and uh, we were introduced to these people and showed around by Terry Jarvis who became a very dear friend and we stayed in the Aboriginal community and had some absolutely mind-boggling experiences I can only imagine and ended up writing the second yeah, ended up writing the second children's book, Baro Bay. Baro being, uh, meaning crocodile in the Gumaps dialect. Um, so, you know, and that came out. And or, you know, at that time, coral reefs weren't really popular. So, or coral reef conservation, I should say, weren't really popular. And so we ended up co-founding a nonprofit called Coral Force that, you know, years ago we really merged with Reef Relief back in Key West, Florida. So our work is, you know, carried on. Yes, and, wonderful. Um, you know, each of the books took about three years from concept to publishing. And we were going to do a third book, and it's like after spending six years on all of this, we looked at each other and we went, uh, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so we we did. We were actually going to focus on the um, old growth forest up in you know, British Columbia with the indigenous people up there and the Native Canadians, and it was just everything was set to go on the research project and the trip, and it was just like I could not see, neither of us could see another three years doing this. So mm -hmm. we left it at the two, but it was, um, yeah, it was a great experience. I loved it. It's, you know, we did teaching programs for elementary schools, and actually did a circular curriculum from kindergarten on up through high school. Which That's I believe recently still have and still marketing. That's through wonderful. Through educational programs. That's wonderful that you all have created a legacy too to, to carry on and, and help future generations learn how to love the environment and care for the, the world we live in. So kudos. Yeah, that is kudos. Important. 
kudos to both of you for that. And yeah, I, thank you all. It was a great adventure. I can I can only imagine. I just it had to have been amazing to go from one environmental area to another just to I mean just I can't I can't begin to fathom but it just it had to have been amazing well and, and what you know at the time I thought was this shows how innocent I was at the time I thought wow you know we really need to get the you know in the first case the rainforest book out in the second case the coral reef out you know, what happens if the rainforest isn't being destroyed and everything's fine in three years? You know, it's like 30 years later, you know, the rainforest is still being destroyed. You know, the coral reefs are still being damaged, you know, and destroyed. Mm -hmm. It's like, haven't we learned yet? So, mm -hmm. uh, if only it had been taken three years to turn everything around, but not so. Yeah. Well, where can people, since we're getting under 10 minutes before the end of the show, where can people find you and to be able, I know in the spirit, Conversations with the Spirit of Jerry Garcia is on Amazon. Are your other, the uh, children's books, are they available on Amazon? because they, everything's been out of print for a long time. Mm -hmm. So they may exist under the used books okay. and stuff. Um, so one book is Panther Dream, and then the other book on the uh, coral reefs is called Baru Bay, that's B as in boy, A-R-U, Bay as in B-A-Y. Uh, and that's about Australia. So, uh, you know, they can go on and check to see what's available or not. So. Okay. Well, what would, um, is it possible for me to um, pass through you to Jerry my sincerest appreciation to he and you for making tonight happen for not just myself but for uh, all the listeners? No. Do it to Jerry. Okay. You have to talk to him directly and send it to him. Just oh. like you're talking to me, you can talk to him. Well, I'm looking at his at the Rolling Stone magazine cover, and I kind of keep glancing at it. It's like he's kind of giving me a sly grin, and then I hear that chuckle in my head, and it's like, okay, I got you. <laughs> but, so, so I mean, seriously, right now, you know, talk to him. Yeah, I mean, thank you, Jerry. Thank you for all the imprints of sound and sights that you've left upon myself and others. Thank you for all of that. Thank you for making tonight happen. Thank you for bringing Wendy and I together to be able to celebrate the person that you were here and the beautiful soul that you are now, beautiful spirit. Um, and and how do you feel when you say that? What, do you feel anything back from Jerry? A very full heart. A very full heart. And a, a very warm... Uh, hey, no problem. <laughs> I, I It's just... <laughs> he, he just seems like he would be just so humble. Like, you know... No, uh, thank you. All right, no problem. Yeah, just keep spreading the word that uh, be kind, be loving, be compassionate, be, be gratefully dedicated to humanity. It's probably the best way I could word it. Be gratefully dedicated to humanity. And and the spirit, nice. spirits and souls around you every day. So. Perfect. 
Wendy, I thank you so much for being on this evening. And it was a super long, because uh, normally I only have a one hour show and for it to be two and a half hours, you've been an amazing guest. And well, it's, it, it's been fun. I mean, that's what it's all about is to share the joy. Yeah, share the share the joy, share the story. Um, and like I, I think I wrote in one of my posts today, you know, talk about times when there were lower prices, higher places, and smiling faces. You know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and and also to you know honor Jerry on the eve of his transition into spirit. Yeah. I feel that's important that we do that with all of our loved ones, uh, you exactly. know, to acknowledge them and celebrate the gifts that they gave us in their life. Yeah, he would he would have been 80 years old. It's you know, it's just an amazing, amazing person, amazing spirit, amazing soul, amazing imagination, creativity talents, skills, just so thankful that you have shared your amazing talent and skill and gift with everyone else and so incredibly thankful that you came on this evening and so thankful that everything intertwined and <laughs> worked out the way it did. It just has made for such a wonderful, wonderful show this evening. Good. Well, I enjoyed it thoroughly, and I knew it would be a wonderful you know, conversation with you, and I look forward to continuing it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I will wrap it up here on Blog Talk with you, and I will shoot you an email after the show with Renee's um address mailing address um and congratulations again to renee cody who got the correct answer of the warlocks i still have my ticket stubs i i miss those days of ticket stubs everything's all scan this and scan that and it's like no that, those were souvenirs <laughs> to have a ticket stub oh, yeah. <laughs> so Thank you, Wendy, sincerely, from the very core of my heart and soul. Thank you so much for this evening. I truly, truly appreciate it. Well, and thank you for the opportunity to, you know, to speak and share everything with you and everyone out there that's you know, yeah. listening to you. So. Thank you so much. And I am going to wrap it up and everyone have a wonderful wonderful evening wendy i'll be in touch with you and uh everyone and, and keep on trucking that's right keep on trucking and keep yeah. on keep on smiling and keep on trucking and keep those dancing bears dancing and just Get out there and share a smile. It might be the only one that somebody gets during the day. Yep. That's wonderful. Okay, well, um, in bringing closure to all of this, I'd just like to thank everyone, too. And of course, you, Sherry, um, for making this happen. I, I appreciate you so, so much. And it's been my pleasure. Believe me, it's been my pleasure indeed. So I will, Great. I'm yeah. going to put us both in mute and I'll tell everyone, like I say, each two, each Monday night, thank you for tuning in. All my love and sweet dreams. This has been a Rift Radio Podcast presentation. Catch all the shows throughout the week. Sunday, the Orion Effect. Monday, on a Tales from the Rocket Chair. Tuesday, True Crime, Mysteries Behind the Veil. And on Wednesday, 
Congrats to you, Renee, Cody. Congrats to you. You did very well. I'm still alive. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> and we interrupt this broadcast to bring you. Get out of here. Congrats to Renee, Cody. And I'll tell you what. What an amazing show and what a dream come true for me. Holy smokes. I have had such a great time. And oh. Oh. Oh, Renee, are you kidding me? Oh. I'll have to add something and send it to you from me. To you. Because. It won't be this far. Sorry. Ooh. I earned some of 88. It's got a lot of holes in the back, but congrats, Renee. If I can spell here. And everyone, uh, this is Facebook only now. Uh, thank you for tuning in. And as always, my love to all of you. And thank you, Jerry, for making this happen tonight. So with that, sweet dreams, everyone. And have a great, 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 super wonderful week. And go out there and be kind to one another. Night. Sweet dreams.